Good morning everybody and welcome to today's service. This week is the beginning of NADOC week and we will be celebrating NADOC week today especially. Uh, NADOC week usually happens in July but because of the COVID outbreak and everything we are having it today this week. It runs for the whole week. Uh, NADOC stands for National Aborigines and Islanders Day Observance Committee and the movement began to grow from the 1920s with the emergences of Aboriginal groups seeking to raise awareness of the uh, treatment and conditions of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The theme for this year's NADOC celebrations is always was, always will be. And that acknowledges the fact that the First Nations peoples have indeed lived on and cared for uh, the Australian continent for more than 60,000 years. So as we gather for worship this morning, we acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we are meeting, wherever that may be. And we recognise their special cultural bonds with these lands. We commit to seeking the reconciliation between First and Second Nations peoples of this land and we pray for this continuing process and those involved in it. Our opening hymn today which sets this theme, Let There Be Love Shared Among Us. <laughs> today to worship our God, the Heavenly Creator. We gather here as people of this time and place, acknowledging our ancestors who came from many and varied lands of the earth, as well as those who were born in Australia, our ancient home. We give thanks that no matter what our background, we are all your people, chosen and loved by you, and for this we offer our praise and our commitment to you the Holy Trinity of life. Amen. So let us pray together. Lord Jesus Christ, by your cross and passion you reconciled the world to God and broke down the barriers of race and culture that divide people and nations. Make us and all your people agents of reconciliation in the life of our church and our world. We ask this through the same Jesus Christ, who with the Father and the Son lives and reigns, one God, now and forever. Amen. For our time of prayer of confession, I invite you to respond with the words, Lord have mercy, which we will say three times. The worth, dignity and equality of all human beings is central to the Christian faith. Let us draw near to God our Father with a true heart to confess our sins 
including our failure to treat all our fellow human beings with dignity and respect. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God and Father, you have created all people in your image, and by your grace in Jesus Christ, drawn people of every nation and language back into your kingdom. We confess that we are often painfully separated by race, culture, power and prestige. We are sorry for our sins of thought, word and deed, for sins of commission as well as omission. We plead for your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only Son to die for us and for his sake. Forgive us all our sins. He has drawn those from every nation and culture who believe in his name into his family as children of God and has given them his Holy Spirit. Grant this, Lord, to us all and help us to grow as brothers and sisters in your universal family. Amen. So in the spirit of forgiveness and peace that has touched the hearts of people everywhere, let us make peace with those around us, and as we light this candle, let us all pray for peace in the world. him now is peace is flowing like a river. stray from the truth of this passage, we would ask that we would not retain any error, but rather that we would remember the truth. May we grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus today. Feed our hearts by faith, with thanksgiving we pray. In Jesus' name, 
Amen. And our first reading comes from Paul's second letter to Corinthians and will be read by Sharon. The first reading today is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verses 17 to 19. When anyone is joined to Christ, he is a new being. The old is gone and the new has come. All this is done by God, who through Christ changed us from enemies into his friends and gave us the task of making others his friends also. Our message is that God was making all mankind his friends through Christ. God did not keep an account of their sins, and he has given us the message which tells how he makes them his friends. For the stories from the founding of your church, thanks be to God. And Sharon will also read our second reading from Matthew's Gospel, beginning at chapter 7. The second reading this morning is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 1 to 5. Do not judge others so that God will not judge you. For God will judge you in the same way you judge others. And he will apply to you the same rules you apply to others. Why then do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the log in your own eye? How dare you say to your brother, please let me take that speck out of your eye when you have a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First, take the log out of your own eye and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. For the good news that Christ brings, thanks be to God. And thank you to Sharon for doing our readings for us. And our hymn now is one of my particular favourites, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Excelling joy of heaven to earth come down, fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown, Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure. Turn and never 
of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the other day I went to our local shopping centre and there was a young woman sitting on the ground asking passers-by for one or two dollars so she could buy some hot chips. And a number of people walked by her either saying they didn't have any money or they didn't have any change or just totally ignoring her. I stopped and I asked her her name and I gave her a few dollars. She thanked me and blessed me. I smiled at her and went on my way, continuing the shopping that I had to do. Oh, man of God, I hear you say. I finished my shopping and I walked back to the car, passing this girl again. She smiled at me and told her friend who had joined her that I had given her money and the friend said thank you to me and also smile at me and, oh, man of God, yes, indeed. And as I went to my car, I thought, perhaps if you weren't smoking, girls, people might be more inclined to give you some cash. And there it was, the judgment. You girls are wasting your money on cigarettes rather than buying food. Not so the man of God now. I have no right to make this judgment, no right whatsoever. I don't know these women's circumstances and what led them to begging on the streets. And as many people say, there by the grace of God go I. If circumstances had been different, that maybe that might be me sitting on the ground with a handout asking for money. Do not judge or you too will be judged. It is easier said than done. It is far easier to judge someone else rather than ourselves. I've been wondering why this is so. Why is it easier to pick the faults of someone else rather than look at our own faults and rectify them? I was wondering, is it something about being in control of the situation? And if I accuse somebody and take the upper hand, then they won't accuse me. Or is it something about fear? Fear of being exposed to public scrutiny and our faults laid open for all to see? Or is it a sense of our own perfection? I am without fault. I am pure. I mean, it happens everywhere. It happens in politics, for example, all the time. A Labour MP will do something not quite right and the Liberals will call for their sacking and hound Labour to do something about it, and yet a Liberal MP will do the same thing, and the Liberals will say something like, it has been taken out of context and it's a different situation. But Labour will do the exact same judgmental behaviour if the shoe is on the other foot. Well, as I was reading this passage, I can't help thinking of that uh, part from John's Gospel in chapter 8, 
where the crowd bring an adulterous woman to Jesus in order to condemn her and stone her to death. And Jesus turns to the crowd and he says, let those without sin cast the first stone. One by one, the crowd drop their rocks and walk away, an acknowledgement that all of them had their own faults. These people were obviously very uncomfortable, and that's what taking a deeper look at ourselves can do to us. It can make us very uncomfortable. We see things in ourselves we don't like, things we try to keep hidden, or we are ashamed of. But what this does is highlights to ourselves a need for change. And people generally find change very hard. They don't like it because it takes away the old comfortable way of doing things or being a certain way or how we act towards others. It is very challenging. And yet we say a certain prayer each week, asking, begging God for change as we have realised that we need it. As it is in heaven, bring it here to earth. As you forgive us, help us to forgive others that way. Save us from evil, because evil abounds. When we look at this prayer, we can extend this out to include, as you judge us, help us judge others. As you condemn us, help us condemn others. As you feed us, help us to feed others. And this is the basis of the ministry of reconciliation that Paul says Christ has given us. At its heart, the ministry of reconciliation is about changing the existing conditions that will then bring about a positive outcome for both sides of the equation. This is the new creation that Paul is talking about, I think. A new creation when we have faith in Christ that reconciles us to ourselves, to the world and to God. When reconciliation works, all is made new. Of course, in Australia, we cannot hear the word reconciliation without thinking of the relationship between First and Second Nations peoples. This has always been a difficult divide, ever since the country was declared terra nullius, an empty land, an uninhabited land, by those who sought to colonise it as a penal settlement. This led to terrible massacres of Aboriginal people, the removal of them from their ancestral lands they had held for over 60,000 years, and their being seen as worthless or second-class citizens at best. And although accepted into the army to risk their lives during times of war, when they returned from the war, they were not given the help and support other soldiers were given. They were not even given the right to vote for those who governed them and were not included in any censuses of the country. And after risking their lives when needed, they were soon shoved again to the outer when the danger was past. But slowly these injustices are being recognised. Slowly there is occurring a change in people's attitudes. Slowly, slowly there is a recognition that we need to do better. Slowly there is a change taking place and slowly we are moving towards a reconciliation between First and Second Nations people of this land. But I think it is up to us to push for this. Our political leaders are notorious for dragging their heels on Aboriginal issues. So we need to keep these issues front and centre. In May 2020, the mining company Rio Tinto destroyed Aboriginal sacred caves in the Dugan Gorge in the Pilbara. Now, 25 to 30 years ago, nothing would have been said about it, let alone any repercussions given out. But now this story has gone worldwide and the people responsible have been punished and Rio Tinto forced to reflect on how they do business. You see, it is all about change. To enable true reconciliation, the two parties need to take a walk in each other's shoes, as the saying goes. They need to understand the other, and they need to find ways in which they can agree and come together. 
the Aboriginal people of Australia have said what they want, and I don't think it is too difficult. It is a recognition that first they exist, and that they deserve to have a voice in Parliament on matters that determine their future. They want this enshrined in the Australian Constitution so that it will exist forever. And they want a fair go in all things. And surely as a people we can agree to this as a first step. It is a recognition of our need to change our ways. If we don't change our ways we are stuck in the past, condemned to repeat past mistakes. To change is to make a new creation, in this case a new world full of hope for the future. Now, I believe that reconciliation is a three-part process. Part one is a reconciliation with our self. We have to look at ourself deeply and see what is wrong and make attempts to fix it. The old adage, this is how I am and people can like it or lump it, doesn't fly anymore. We need to improve where we can improve we have to walk in someone else's shoes. Part two is reconciliation with those around us. Not to judge people begging in the street, but to ask how they got there and what do they need and what can we do to help? These are the questions of someone seeking reconciliation. And part three is reconciliation with God. Recognise the need to bring all before God and to try to be more like the incarnation of God on earth, our Saviour Jesus Christ. Because God knows us, he knows everything about us. But do we seek to be more in tune with God? And the beauty, I think, of this process is that it's not a case of you have to do part one before you can do part two, and you have to do part two before you can do part three. No, all parts are done at the one time. It's a simultaneous way of doing things because they are all interconnected. Working on any particular part helps immediately in working on the other parts. Any achievement in one part is an achievement in another part. And that is the beauty of the system. And all it takes is a single recognition of the need to change. To call ourselves Christians and not change is hypocritical. So next time you see someone sitting on the ground begging for a couple of dollars to buy some hot chips, take a moment to think about their situation. Take a moment to put yourself in their shoes and to give thanks for where you are. And then give them a smile, ask them their name and put a few dollars into their hand. Change your own judgments you may have had against them and change their minds about being in a hopeless situation. Give them hope and let us all make a new creation, a new heaven on earth. Amen. So let us pray. God of mercy and the seeker of reconciliation, Grant us the desire and the courage to look deeply at the relationships we have with ourself, our world, and with you. Help us to make the necessary changes in these things, so that we can effectively carry out the ministry of reconciliation that you have entrusted to us. We ask this in Christ's precious name. Amen. Together, let us say the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. 
I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And our next hymn is a song that's, or a hymn that simply asks God to guide us. Guide me, O thou great Redeemer. you to respond with hear our prayer at the appropriate time. Loving God, give us the courage to accept the realities of our history so that we may build a better future for our nation. Teach us to respect all cultures. Teach us to care for our land and waters. Help us to share justly the resources of this land. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to bring about spiritual and social change to improve the quality of life for all peoples in our communities, especially the disadvantaged. Help all young people to find true dignity and self-esteem by your spirit. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May your power and love be the foundations on which we walk together as first and second peoples and build our families, our communities and our nation. Lord, in your mercy, 
hear our prayer. And for this community, we bring our special requests before you, O Lord. We pray for Jim and Grant as Jim faces ongoing health issues. We pray for Declan's friends, especially their son, Jimmy. We pray for healing for Celie's cousin, Ida. We continue to pray for Jill, a dear friend of Margaret and Sydney and her ongoing treatment for a medical condition. We pray for Paul and Rhonda's friends Jill and Graham as Jill continues facing health issues and also for their friend Nancy also facing health issues. We pray for Ivy and Gus and Sharon Tyler. We pray for Mary's friend Connie for strength. We pray for Ray and Jenny for healing, especially as Ray faces treatment. We pray for Chrissy for continued strength and encouragement. We pray for Barbara and Paul, and especially Brody as she deals with health issues. And we also pray for Lorraine, Barbara's sister-in-law, who also has health issues. We pray for Beryl and her family, especially her brother Bob and sister Mary. And we pray for, pray for Phil for continued peace and support. We pray for Jan and Wall as they face together Jan's health issues. We continue our prayers for Faye, Suzanne's sister in Queensland, also with health issues. And we continue praying for our friend Pearlie who is uh, reaching some healing and is much better than she was. So we give thanks for that and we continue for praying, continue praying for healing for her. And this week, as we look to opening our church up again, we give thanks for our volunteers who are about to resume working in the op shop and in the garden. Remembering with love those who won't be continuing their work with us and we wish them well and give them thanks for their service. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And now together in whatever language we feel most comfortable with, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We have a few notices this week. The first one is again a reminder of the coffee cup challenge, which uh, our church is registered for. So please put aside the cost of a cup of coffee each week, which will be collected prior to Shrove Tuesday next year. And we'll go towards supporting the work of uniting the agency arm of the Uniting Church. And uh, another reminder that we are also collecting groceries which will be donated uh, in food hampers to help those who will be struggling over the Christmas period. With a lot of people being unemployed, more people than ever will need some help. Our next notice is con our congratulations to Salesa Alafia, or as we know, Arnetta, who has finished her 100 kilometer walk, raising funds for the Black Dog Institute. So we congratulate her for her efforts with that. It's still not too late to make a donation if you would like to. If you just go to the uh, Black Dog website and find a way through to Arnetta's page and you can help with her donations. Uh, today, Sunday the 8th, we're having our first gathering in the garden, our first church picnic. And next week, I remind people that we will be having the second one. 
and we will invite those who haven't been to the first one and uh, it's a great way for us to get together and reconnect after our COVID lockdown so if you come to those picnics you'll need to bring a chair and a mask and something to drink and something to eat and let's have some fun together and uh, get to know each other once again see each other's lovely faces so that's this afternoon that all the people have been invited but next week look out for your invitation uh, this Wednesday is Remembrance Day, of course, the 11th of November. At 11 o'clock in the morning, we will be putting up a just a little uh, Remembrance Day reflection. And you will get a link for that. So that's the usual way of accessing that. And uh, for that service, have photos of people you want to remember. Uh, yes, Remembrance Day is generally for those who have served in war, but because of the COVID lockdown this year, we're including anybody who has passed away this year who you would like to remember. So bring their photos, bring a candle. There will be a time when we can reflect upon them. So I invite you all to do that. And also next week, we, on Wednesday the 11th, the op shop will be reopening between 9 and 9 a.m. 3 p.m. For the rest of this year, the op shop will only be open on Wednesdays and Fridays, and uh, it will be the strict COVID rules will apply. And uh, just to remind volunteers that there is a training session on Tuesday the 10th. So that's just a reminder of that. And it just shows uh, with the great numbers we've had here in Victoria that things are moving forward. And uh, again, I give thanks to all those volunteers who have offered their time to help around the church. And our words of mission. People of God, go from here to live out the covenant into which we, the first and second peoples of this land, have entered with one another. Confront and challenge injustice wherever you see it. Act justly yourselves and insist that others do the same. Rejoice in the richness of our diverse cultures and learn from them. Celebrate and demonstrate the unity we share in Jesus our Lord. Commit to worship, witness and serve as one people under God until God's promised reconciliation of all creation is complete. And our blessing and dismissal. Bless us, therefore, as we depart this place. Give us a generous spirit, a kind heart, and the grace to walk alongside our first peoples as brothers and sisters in Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in the power of God's good spirit, with the gentle fire of God's zeal, with the breath of life, ready to work for justice and peace. We go in Christ's name. Amen. And our final hymn is called, Lead Kindly Light. The words are from a poem written in 1833 titled Pillar of the Cloud, written by Cardinal John Henry Newman, and this version is sung by Audrey Assad. <laughs>
joining us. It's great to have this time of worship with you. May we pray for your families and remember the Remembrance Day service at 11 o'clock on Wednesday. I have a photo of a loved one and candle with you and we will see you next week. Bye now.